NFL Podcast. As a very freaky post-Super Bowl tradition. Welcome, and you'll never know what it is, to another edition of the Around the NFL Podcast. My name is Dan Hansis. I come to you from a virtual room filled with some heroes, Mark Sessler, Reg Rosenthal, and boys, you know, this is big, this is big, big boy pants stuff. This is big leagues. Joining us, a very special guest, um, taking a break from being on literally every single show over in Bristol. It's the great, borderline iconic, Mina Kimes. <laughs> Welcome back to the ATN <laughs> podcast, Mina. How you doing? Thank you. Yeah, it's been a, about a year, I guess. Well, no, more than a year because um, we did a podcast in person, so it must have been pre-pandemic. You oh, brought us goodness. treats, I recall. You had been to um, some sort of favorite grocery store of yours, and you brought us um, trinkets and treats in a, in a live studio setting. Was that the hip hop? That's not what happened. What happened? They were hip hop snacks, but it wasn't yeah. a favorite grocery store. It was a convenience store that I bought the treats at because I had to throw up in the bathroom. I don't know if you guys oh, remember. Right. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, you did come on I during the so pandemic. Um, I think it was Claybon and Colleen was in the mix, and we had okay. like no agenda. It was the most formless uh, podcast we've ever. That done. was that was Mina's <laughs> flu game. Her flu podcast. <laughs> that no was, push it off was not, not my finest hour, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so happy to have you here, Mina. And we're going to have a great show today. Um, coming up later on, we're going to take you inside the minds, the minds of uh, various NFL figures and let you understand what's going on in their inner thoughts, the inner monologue. Uh, the stuff that you don't want you to hear, they don't want their teammates to hear, they don't want the media to hear, but we're going to hear. And that's pretty good. Um, uh, but before we get to that, Mina, I wanted to touch base quickly with you on something based off our last podcast. We had like a, a, a conversation that I really enjoyed, which was, what does it mean to be a fan? How important is it to win a championship? Mm. Do fans put too much value on titles when we should be more appreciative of teams? who routinely put together fun, competitive seasons. Greg was coming from this angle. We were talking about the Falcons and yeah. what they could be doing this season. Um, and I think you're the perfect person to ask this question, Mina, because you're a diehard Seahawks fan. You got to enjoy the Super Bowl 48 win. You've mixed in plenty of heartbreak and disappointment in the years before and after. You're also a massive Seattle Mariners fan, a franchise that has never won a World Series in 45 years. In fact, they're the only team in MLB, and I don't, I'm not telling, I'm not breaking news to Mina Kimes here, the only team in MLB, MLB without so much as a World Series appearance in their history. Um, so I think winning a title, and Mark kind of agreed with my feeling on it, is a point of catharsis that fans need to, to kind of let you know that it was all worth something. Where do you come down on this? Because I feel like you're qualified uniquely on some level. Well, thank you for that Mariners recap. Just uh, mm, really enjoyed that. Um, Maybe this year. Yeah, I think we're batting 199. Mm. Little the Mendoza <laughs> line. So that's... So that's, is everybody else. So. Yeah, true, true. Uh, but the Mariners were no hit like twice in one week. Or something. <laughs> the worst people always try to talk trash to me uh, on Twitter about the Mariners. And I'm like, you really think I feel anything when yeah. you say this to me? Um, I actually think the Seahawks are a good vantage point for the question you raised, which is the importance of winning a championship, competing uh, versus ripping it all up and illustrative about illustrative of how in football, the timelines and stakes and realities of that are different from other sports. Um, you know, in basketball, I think you really have to have X, Y, Z in place to compete. Whereas when earlier this summer, when there were summer, spring, when there were a lot of rumors about Russell Wilson, um, there was a strain of thought, well, the Seahawks aren't going to win a Super Bowl anyways. Uh, so why not trade Russell Wilson, maximize his return, rip it up and start over? To which I said, yeah, there's no, the Seahawks are not one of the five best rosters in football, but it's football. They might win. Like, I don't like who's to say, right? Like we can't. It's far more unpredictable uh, with the single elimination playoffs. It's far more likely that weird <laughs> could happen. You can get that Nick Foles Flacco run. And I believe if you have. And this is this was my very long winded path towards your question. <laughs> if you have a quarterback who's good, you should just always try to win. I think. Um, if you don't, that's where it gets a little more complicated. Yeah, right. and it's not like I wasn't saying you're not going to get catharsis. Like, of course, it's always going to be nice. I'm just saying, like, ultimately, that's not going to be your only 
you're going to get more value out of the journey and everything else. Or else, like, what are you doing? Like, you're still talking about the Rex Ryan uh, days, Dan, and how much you enjoyed it. Or, like, if if you can't have fun with teams that don't win the title, then you're never going to have any fun. Is kind my, of my but point. my argument is that it's like a rich person. Greg is a Patriots fan. Right telling people with no money, it's great to experience poverty. It's good for you, and, and it's, there's something to learn from it. Like, you're talking to a Seahawks fan who heart, whose heart was broken by the Patriots. Your example previously was the Falcons, who were destroyed um, astronomically by the Patriots. So I'd that, say, that, it's more like the Michael, person My point was they had, you had Michael Vick. You've had some uh, good times. I guess what I'm saying is, like, a title, it's not going to take away the emptiness that's inside you. Like, you think it will, but after, <laughs> well, like, true. a couple of weeks, you're just kind of back to <laughs> Well, that's a better thesis. You had you, now, had you started well, see, with now that, we're on the same page. Me. If right. you pull it back, go above the treetops, I think the reason I, I guess, do I talk about the Rex Ryan Jets all the time? Maybe I do. Uh, that's all I got. I'm like Mina right. with the sea, with the Mariners. I've never even seen my team in a Super Bowl. Uh, and, you know, I think competitive teams, it's a little ephemeral, whereas flags fly forever. I actually believe that. You have that forever. You have the DVD. You have the memories, all that. Anyway, fun. Good May 20th <laughs> talking point in a big spot. All right, let's do some news. Otani's going to the Angels. No! <laughs> I don't get enough of this on ESPN platforms. Is the pile up? <laughs> oh, Christ. Is, that, is it annoying that he's like the best player on the planet? Well, you right immediately, now? I disprove, I now look like a total liar because less than five minutes ago, I was. I said, you can't hurt me as a Maris fan. I feel nothing. <laughs> and and there I am being hurt all over again. Yeah, that was it hurts. What, live like when he dis- he decided where he was going? Yes, that was, so we, were, that, we weren't on TV. We were in a commercial break, but the generous uh, Around the Horn producers decided to share that with the world. Yeah, <laughs> and it's had a lasting effect because I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be kind of connect to what we were talking about at the top of the show. And <laughs> sure enough, it was on YouTube on like 14 different um, entries. <laughs> Easy well, enough to find. The Mariners are a good example by a team that should have ripped it up early. Well, I don't want to get into it, but the, the central question <laughs> is should you rip it up or try to compete, right, in every sport? And this is something that is a matter of debate uh, amongst many teams. And I think the Mariners should have ripped it up earlier and done the rebuild and gone full Astros slash Cubs slash whatever. And um, they're doing it now. And there's some NFL teams that might be doing that now as well. All right, let's get to it. Let's start with Bruce Arians. Bruce Arians on top of the world, Super Bowl champion coach. He's 68 years old now um there was a report right around the super bowl that if if the bucks won the big game which they did that he would maybe walk into the sunset no way arians is a lifer and he spoke on uh the pewter report a uh, tampa bay buccaneers podcast about the idea of how he sees kind of the back nine of his career going one that might not include tom brady here's what arians had to say uh i could i could get extremely excited about having another young quarterback and going to war with one, uh, I'd be, I'll be honest with you. I'd be excited to take Blaine Gabbert and go to war. Cause I love Blaine <laughs> Gabbert. I think he's the most underrated player in the NFL. <laughs> Blaine Gabbert's listening and being like, pay me. You like, <laughs> let me be a free agent for a month and gave me $3 million. Pay me. I, I haven't heard such like Gabbert, uh, defense and standing since MJD would just tirelessly, uh, try to tell me that he was uh, like a diamond in the rough that was just uh, given a, a bad hand in life. And he's got Bruce Arians agreeing with him. I don't believe this for a second, really, though, either. I feel like Bruce Arians, if they had a bad season with Tampa and it wasn't fun, you know, he would just as easily walk away. Of course, like right now he's having fun and it, it sounds like he would want to play forever, but he or coach forever. But he he left pretty quickly last time and seemed about done at that point. So the one thing I note, though, is that you know, Arians was tied to Gabbard in Arizona too, and he. I went back and looked at some quotes from 2017, and he gushed about Gabbard as a future starter. And so maybe there's just some of these coaches have these traits that they love. The one time I, I talked to Bruce Arians, also like the Browns fan of me, about Kelly Holcomb, who was for about a season and a half incredible for the Cleveland Browns. I mean, Arians just gushed about him for like 10 straight minutes. It was like too much I could put into the article. So I think he just finds these dudes and falls in love. You think, and of course, Gabbert was a first round pick and a bust with the Jaguars. And like, 
There's a speaking of baseball. There's a saying the old scouting community. Oh, he's got a good face, and they actually put stock in someone being good looking. Gabbert's a very handsome man. <laughs> Do you think? And he looks the part. Obviously, I think he was even in draft day. Maybe I don't know. He's but, pretty but athletic. He, like he, he checks the boxes. It like, do you sense. think the way, Mina, do you think the way that Blaine Gabbert looks makes certain coaches say, this guy, everything makes sense here. I could fix him. He looks like a star. The, like, money ball thing? Um, yeah. Well, I'll say this about Blaine Gabbert. He looks like someone named Blaine Gabbert. Like, completely. Right. Like, if you had to visualize a guy named Blaine Gabbert, it would look exactly like <laughs> Blaine really Gabbert. I was, but um, your point, Mark, about the Arians type, if you will, I was thinking that during the draft when they took Trask. I was like, oh, yeah. That's an Arians guy, <laughs> like no question, and that's not a compliment, people. Like I, I, I'm, I was not particularly high on Trask, mm. but I just think he can't resist the like tall pocket passer. Um, he's making it work. I mean, he's made it work well, with Bet, with to... Roethlisberger and Palmer. He's he's zigging well. They're zagging. Mark had a big theory throughout his first season in Tampa Arians that like he was totally checked out and was I'm like, Janus. was almost no, wishing I'm, I'm that he was NFL. with Trent green. Well, like yeah. he was more checked out than he was alongside <laughs> Trent green in the CBS booth, which is tar- uh, which Well, is I would not say that he was more checked out than he was beside <laughs> Trent green. He did not want to be in that booth, but the, the first year in Tampa with Jameis Winston throwing like five interceptions in the London game and like 28 pick sixes, he looked a little tired to me. Um, but I am ultimately wrong. No one can convince me that Bruce Arians was a broadcaster for one year. I, it didn't happen. <laughs> Show me the proof. I demand it. I hey, don't think it did happen. I think he was there. But his yeah. voice, by the way, whenever he talks, I just did a panel with him on um, the all the women, the, the diversity. Yeah, and <laughs> and um, every time he talks, I'm surprised in you by this. I've, I've heard this man thousands of times, right? And every time he speaks, there's like a softness to his mm. voice it's a little higher than you expect mm. it actually sounds like what he looks like which is a hired assassin like an who's like been in the business for a long time he talks <laughs> like that a little bit i don't is that an accent am i where's I he from know. i'm not sure he's from ricky mm. can you find out where bruce arians it's, it's distinct it's like the philly, philly area I think. it always takes me back a little bit um in other news jeff schultz uh reporter for the athletic leads a Right up on the Julio Jones situation with the Falcons, thusly. The Falcons would like to trade Julio Jones, period. End of sentence, okay? So it's uh, this guy that's plugged in deeply to the team knows it. Now, the question becomes, Mark Sessler, does it happen? How do they make it happen? They have some very real problems. You've talked about it, Mark, often on this podcast, this offseason. They have major salary cap issues. To the extent that they can't sign their rookie class right now, and Julio Jones, moving him off the books, would solve a major real hurdle. Is it going to happen? Is this thing, is it fate at this point? I think, it, I think you've got to mix in what, you know, our friend Steve Weish has reported to. They don't want to. It's not really about the player, but they are in a position, you know, as the, as the article noted, um, they can't really even sign their draft picks right now. And so I think that they're, they're kind of stuck. And like, you look at Thomas Dimitrov, who's, you know, not really being mentioned enough. Part of your job as GM is not to get the team, if you can help it, into this kind of situation. They weren't a team that won five Super Bowls, and the, you know, with that as an excuse. But I think it's very real. I mean, just the reporting suggests it's very real. And that there were a limited number of teams that probably are targets. They talk about the Niners, the, the Patriots, um, maybe the Ravens. I think the Colts could be a team in there. But they almost have to move him if they can't get Grady Jarrett um, to restructure, who's also getting paid $20 million, But they talked about Grady Jarrett, Jarrett's agent not really um, necessarily like the most uh, bendable, flexible guy on that front. Maybe not totally game to wanting to do that. So, you know, the Falcons are in a tough spot. Well, you're so afraid of Grady Jarrett's agent that you can't uh, keep like the greatest player in franchise history? I mean, I don't know. I see this is, this is on your uh, radar here, Mina. You started... <laughs> You started tweeting quite a bit this week. I mean, uh, this morning about about this story. Streets are talking that this this entire column might have been like a subtweet or like a sub column um, <laughs> responding no to some Mina Kimes. I no no streets are talking. Um, I did <laughs> put out a video saying that it didn't make sense to me. Not that the Falcons are broke. Everyone knows that. But the fact that they're um, looking to trade Julio to clear up some cap space doesn't square to me with 
everything else they've done this offseason, which was which began before the draft with restructuring Matt Ryan's contract, which was the first sign that they perhaps were not going to draft a quarterback, right? Because they basically tied the team to Matt Ryan for two seasons. It'd be really painful for them to move on before then. And then, of course, in the draft, they don't take a quarterback. They take Kyle Pitts. Um, you don't rebuild around Kyle Pitts. I, I love Kyle Pitts, the player, but he was the highest drafted tight end ever. Um, to me, if you're a rebuilding team, you take Justin Fields there and you don't restructure Matt Ryan months before. So I don't understand why you would do those things and then trade Julio for some cap relief and like a future optimistically second round pick. And I say that optimistically based on what I'm hearing. I could be wrong. Um, You're not going to get an impact player. You didn't get a pick that you could use this year. I just, it feels like um, mixed messages from the organization. And I have yet to hear a good reason why you don't restructure Grady Jarrett, who's one of the most underrated defensive players in football, other than Todd France is scary. Uh, that's Dak Prescott's agent. And they haven't agent. even tried like, that. Like, why? Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Like, getting tried, an extension right? could be hard. Getting an extension for Jarrett, which also would make sense, could be hard. But literally any player will say, yes, I'll take. If if right. you want to give me my $20 million today and then spread it out over the rest of my contract, they will take it that day. It is not hard. It, the, the article from Schultz made me think, though, that they ex- they really do want to trade Julio. And this was the first time that I thought, okay, this actually is probably going to happen if I had to guess. You know, I, I don't really know. And I, and I don't get it. Not just, like, message sending of rebuilding or not, but just, like, this offense could be awesome. I don't know. They If they could be a top-five offense, they could absolutely be in the playoffs. They could absolutely have a meaningful season. And you're going to do that for some second-round pick. It just does – that part doesn't make any That's sense. That's the thing, too. Like, this, this is a team that had four wins last year. I tweeted this. They had the Pythagorean wins of a seven-and-a-half team win uh, – win team based on their point differential. They're going to be better. They upgraded at coaching. They brought Dean Pease out of retirement, which I feel like every, no, is kind of being yeah. overlooked. Arthur Smith, amazing offensive coach. There's totally a case for this team blowing defenses out of the water. Matt Ryan, whom I love, having a comeback season. Don't trade Julio. I, I don't all, get it. We're all in agreement then. Restructure Grady Jarrett and let's go. Oh, let's not <laughs> overthink this, Atlanta Falcons. In other news, ESPN's Adam Schefter reported that Joe Burrow, recovering from that nasty knee injury, is, quote, all systems go for week one and that uh, quote came directly the all systems go uh, from the doctor that has worked with Burrow uh, week one is against the Vikings we'll see how they handle the the summer and, and preseason and all that but that's very good news uh, Mina have Burrow back on the field and on that note I'll just throw it out there since we're here very nice year coming up for comeback player of the year race like we knew last year what was going to happen Ooh. Alex Smith if he made it back, don't even have a vote. We know this year it's wide open. And I'm going to give you some odds here. Um, Dak Prescott leads the way, coming back from the fractured ankle, plus 175. Saquon, Burrow, and CMC, all plus 600. Nick Bosa, plus 700. And then some long shots for you to chew on here, everybody. Derwin James, Von Miller, plus 1,600. Odell, Marky, Plus 2,500, and then Jimmy G as a real long shot, plus 5,000. Who do you like, Mina Kynes? Um, I think the, those odds accurately reflect the likelihood of every player. I, I don't, um, I would say probably Barkley's a bit of a long shot. Um, I would go Bosa over Barkley and CMC mm-hmm. personally, but it does seem like Dax to lose, Dax or Burrow. How about Matt Ryan? Where is he? Plus 4,000. Get like the Philip R- Rivers Memorial Comeback Player of the Year where Philip Rivers came back from being like the 18th best quarterback and then was the sixth. Like, I, I could see that. You if know, they there's keep like... Julio, then your boy Matt Ryan had well, it's could, Matt Ryan comeback that be, season. That could I'm be Carson. What if Carson went through 40 Ooh, yeah. touchdowns in, you know, Indianapolis? I was going to say like back in, I think it was 1997, they gave Rafael Palmero the gold glove and he played like 14 games at first base. There had to be that year... Uh, that they gave Phil Rivers comeback player of the year because he threw a bunch of interceptions the year before. There had to be some nose tackle that shredded his Achilles and played every snap the next year and made the Pro Bowl that just didn't get love because he, was he wasn't a quarterback. Can I 
take over and ask you guys a question that I feel <laughs> sure. like I'm not getting a good answer from. You could have just asked what, it. You, I what like do the, you think? Ask you to take over. I like that you frame it as taking over. That is, that's well, a power. Like, it's a, it's a window into your mind here. Yeah. yeah, I'm redirecting the, I'm, I didn't come on, you didn't co- ask me to come on and ask questions, but that's what I'm doing. What do you <laughs> think is the likelihood, just give it a percent, that Carson Wentz in 2021 is better than Philip Rivers was in 2020? funny we just had this conversation oh. on on some level on our last show and i'm kind of on the wentz wagon and a lot of it is frank reich related the phil rivers bar that's the thing that maybe i'm curious what you guys think was the bar is it a, where is that bar was it a pretty low bar to clear is it a i know it wasn't a high bar it was like maybe a medium bar i think wentz can clear what rivers did last year because uh, i think he has upside and gets the fresh start with good coaching that's where i come down is it- What's your percent? I'm giving it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Seventy four percent. Because I'm uh, such a Rivers fan and not a Wentz fan, I'm going to give it seven percent. Oh, seven. I mean, River, ah. Rivers was like I would say Rivers was like seven. the 14th best quarterback yes. in the league or something. So he was but in the 10 does, to 15 range. It yes. it does matter to me that he played fantastic in the playoff game. I know it didn't end yes. that well, but he he played as well or better than Josh Allen, an MVP candidate in that game. Like he played great in that game, so that that counts for me. I would so Dan is officially a Wentz head. Um, I am I'm not. I'm skeptical. So I'm going to put it at forty one point six percent chance. That's probably good. It's probably the right answer. All right, that's good. That's what's happening in the news. By the way, Tim Tebow officially signed. He's number eighty five. Minshew, number fifteen. Probably going to trade him. Tebow get fifteen. But who can? I mean. I don't want to go down this room. He will not be on the team by the time, what? by the time uh, Minshew gets traded. I, I don't, don't want to think. talk about it. Let's save it for another show. I just, I'm still trying. I was, the more I thought about this today, cause I hadn't really thought about it since it, this became a story, but like, why is urban Meyer actually doing this? I almost think it's something personal. And he's just doing his buddy a favor that that's it. Did so that's many it. Great things. That's a hundred percent. It. His wife said he, Tim Tebow will always be a son to us. And so, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Let's get into it. Inner monologue time. How do you feel about this, Mina? You feel good about this seg? Um, I think it's creative. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, we 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 had some you know meeting of the minds here. Like we were like, what can we do the next six or seven weeks that's not just previewing the season, which we're gonna do almost every day yeah. starting in July. So it's it's a tough. It's uh, we a tough ranked spot. defenses last week. That that felt mm. pretty bottom of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's good. Just some uh, good rankings. The Mina Kime show sorry. featuring Lenny. Erica oh, yeah, Tamposi, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Featuring Lenny. Um, <laughs> Erica Tamposi reports via the producer's chair that uh, Bruce Arians is from Patterson, New Jersey, but he grew up in York, Pennsylvania, home of 1990 alternative rock stalwart live. So really? who's the most famous person to come out of York? You decide. I go and call check. I um, it's a push. What's on lightning me. crashes? That's it. Oh yeah, it was a tough lightning one. crashes. Dan and I that? are like secret live, not even secret, overt live fans. <laughs> Wait, is there Matt another Money song? Smith. What's what's another song that they've done? Uh, psh, all over you, uh, selling the drama, the dolphins cry. I mean, we are the dolphins cry is great. Like, what's the one that you and I um started uh, to love that no one else knows Dan oh, about wow. Beauty and Gray? We the go Dolph- deep. We go deep cuts off mental what, jewelry the, in '92. The Dolphins Cry mental would be jewelry. a great Monday Night Football outro, Ooh. like I, you know, <laughs> and they do true. those really clever like references. Just the whatever you do, don't bathe in light. <laughs> Lightning crashes for the Chargers too. Mm. Don't it's confuse. Uh, don't confuse live though with the band that did, mm, or else uh, <laughs> Dan and Mark get very upset. You know that they, oh, the crash test dummies. Those were, oh, the, the crash test dummies. Those were. Those I have were no feelings bands. for that band. Very Nor different bands. Um, all right, let's get into it. Inner monologue, inner thoughts oh, yeah. uh, that people in the NFL are afraid to share with anyone but themselves. I'll get things going, and I will. Uh, I'm going to take you inside the mind of Las Vegas Raiders general manager Mike Mayock. Here we go. I feel that I'm under an alarming amount of pressure. That Alex Leatherwood pick. (laughs) Kind of wish I had that one back. People were pretty mean to me about that. 
When I saw John that night in the break room, he said, You outsmarted everybody again, Mikey. Was he messing with me? (laughs) He kind of said it through gritted teeth. Is that how he always talks? I need to watch one of those Corona commercials to be sure. I could use a beer. (laughs) Focus, Mike. Leatherwood. He'll be fine. Need some of these other draft picks to help me out, though. Rugs, Arnett, Jacobs and Abram. What the hell happened to those guys last year? Cleveland Farrell? What was I thinking? So stupid. John has a 10-year contract. They're going to come for me if these guys don't improve. I wonder if NFL Network would give me my old job back. Daniel Jeremiah. <laughs> Scout jockey. <laughs> I'm hungry. Let me get a taco. Mm. A lot of pressure from Mike. Oh, we're still going. Oh. <laughs> I, I no, feel yeah, we're, out, we're out of the mind. We're out of his mind. Were we supposed to write these? <laughs> well, I, I, I was just going to wing it. No, you, you can wing do it, it anyway. You're, 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 okay. you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're the guest. Um, you know, we, we've done this enough. We all know what we're going to eat. Turn in your homework at the like end the of idea. the episode, Nina. Yeah, I do like the idea <laughs> of Mike Mayock as, a, as like this self-doubting guy because he never <laughs> gives off that impression whatsoever whatsoever uh but there has to be a little bit of doubt creeping in i mean you do you do feel for him as a human because he knows how, how like amazing this opportunity was like it was perfect for him it's not like it's a kid getting picked out of the stands to like be on the team but it's about as close as you'll probably get in in the nfl it's it's virtually unprecedented and he knows that this year matters and they've they've had so many draft picks over the last three or four years like they did that part right everyone says get a million draft picks take a million swings and they've they, they, the 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 team is absolutely in his image and john gruden's history will indicate that he will absolutely use mayak as a scapegoat if if it doesn't work this well, year well, i would say and, i think and one right. problem is even, even if leatherwood um is a plus performer your average fan is not going to be tracking leatherwood on sundays the way they would if it was like you picked up this running back that goes for like 1600 yards or a wide receiver blowing people up a little bit difficult it's so perfect that the hated raiders draft pick this year was a lineman named alex leatherwood you just you couldn't make that up all right ended up being um who did they take after him the db um morig or Merrick, well, Merrick, yeah, Trevon Merrick. It was if if simply if they had switched the picks, everybody would have been cool with the draft. Like if they had taken Merrick before Leatherwood in the exact same spots, they ended up with the same players. So it was kind of he stuck to his TCU. guns. He's he's like <laughs> stuck to his esoteric draft boards three years in a row, which does indicate I don't think he's too uh, worried about what what people like us are saying. Mina, you're up next. Take us inside the mind of who? Um, I'll do Von Miller. First, right. mm. there we go. Probably, no one expect the same level of performance. I, God, the pressure. All right, speaking of pressure, man, I'm a favorite to win comeback of the year. My defense is as stacked as it's been since the Super Bowl run. We are well coached. Bradley Chubb's opposite me. Uh, we re-signed Shelby Harris. Our secondary is ridiculous. This is one of the best secondaries I've ever played with. We got Kyle Fuller in the mix. We drafted that kid with the dad who everyone's excited about. <laughs> but you guys know we're not winning shit with Drew Locke. Mm. Every day at practice, I got to watch that guy throw passes that I know our defense would intercept. So Aaron, if you're listening... Whatever it takes, get out here, man. I can't. I can't go out like this. I just can't. Von no. Miller out. <laughs> I like when you said you guys know. <laughs> and then if you make a, a impassioned like. Uh, yeah, I was. You reach hard. to Aaron Rodgers. This is all inside the mind of Von Miller. Yeah. So now I have more questions. I mean, oh, okay, so it would have been more like maybe I should text Aaron. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of but an Aquaman skill set potentially. You know. <laughs> if I had there, written it, I would have thought this through a little bit. more. No, no, that. I, man, I'm at, where, where do they, if they ever, if they ever, ever, ever found a way to get Rodgers there, like, where do they come down when you, like, put together the top teams in the AFC? Are they right Dep- behind the Chiefs to you, if that ever happened? Depends Absolutely. who they gave up. Depends, like, if they happen to give up, like, Bradley Chubb and Jerry Judy and someone else, then maybe that would change something. 
Uh, but no, I would think I would put him number one. I mean, I, I would even... Whoa! Because I, I don't know if it was you that said this, Mean or I, last week. It's like, there's like a lot of rosters better than the Chiefs. It's like, yeah. they just have Patrick Mahomes. Like, yeah. the Chiefs do not... Like, if the Chiefs were given Kirk Cousins, they've got like the 12th best roster in the league. You know, so I, if you put Aaron Rodgers on the Broncos, I... Like, where did you rank the Broncos in your defense rankings? It's got They've got to be top five. I, I had them at three, and I was that's, that's very nervous saying. about that. But that defense is incredibly stacked, and so Aaron Rodgers, the number three defense, you. and some and some good parts around them. I I think they might be the favorites. You're right, though, Von Miller. Like people on the like veterans on the Broncos have to be actually feeling this, like thinking I don't, this. Like, I don't going, think people. If there's like a thing that I can convey about. NFL players that maybe they don't express publicly it's how sick defensive players get of playing with shit quarterbacks mm. like privately those are the like it, it wears on you right and how many yeah. short fields do you deal with when you have a quarterback throwing an interception on your own 15 you know brutal at least Teddy's more likable they'll, they'll at least like like him in the locker room you know oh, I forgot about I forgot to mention Teddy yeah. <laughs> don't don't we, so we're having we're having we've had like wormhole. we've had a few TED talks recently Nina that have <laughs> kind of been a little bit it's gotten a little salty uh, Greg you're up okay buddy. I think I went too long I'm realizing now all right here we go uh, <laughs> this is uh, inside the mind of Urban Meyer oh boy I got <laughs> this i'm not chip <laughs> kelly i'm not nick saban jumping to the nca at the first sign of trouble who do these people think they're dealing with so what if i hired a racist strength coach what am i zip recruiter <laughs> so what if i played travis at the end at wide receiver in minicamp there's no tackling you nimrods and big deal if i want to let timmy have his little tight end fantasy camp with us I could play Trevor Lawrence's painting brother at H-Pack and we, we would steamroll this division. Oh, Carson Wentz, please. He couldn't have started at North Dakota State last year. The Titans the Titans are three offensive players in Mike Vrabel's haircut. The, the Texans are all right. Though. Oh. I like that Easterby guy. Still, I got this. I've got my national media friends in my back pocket. We got Fox. We got NFL Network. I've got my less media down here than I've got in Columbus. I've got Joe Cullen, that guy who was naked in the Wendy's drive-thru running my defense. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a change offensive football with my beautiful Trevor and my cutting-edge play caller, um, uh, Daryl Bevel. Uh, I, all I need is to schedule some non-conference cupcakes in September, and we'll be top five in the coaches' poll before oh, you know it oh, i've got this oh man that man is not at a loss for confidence internally at least <laughs> it's going nimrods on people that's yeah. not a, it's a, a sharp cutting not insult totally right there. clear on what the nfl schedule is but I, you know listen he'll in time in time just, uh, mm, not just wrong about something. the division urban yeah yeah right just something about just something about that the, He's on your radar, vibe. Greg. He's so on my radar. And the interviews he has with the with the media members who are all buddies with him, they're on my radar. He just <laughs> feels like he thinks he's ab- above the rest of it. Oh, I'm not. No, we're going to find okay. out. He's got to put up results, and he's got the kid. I mean, who else? Like, no one has criticized these hires. No one's criticized. Well, maybe people are starting to criticize it, but uh, it's like. He ups I, the I interest level, though. Like I, I now, for a lot of reasons, want to watch the Jaguars, where I, you know, strongly avoided them. There's just years. like a lot of belief, and maybe he. There's a there's a total chance that he's gonna, you know, be good and make them nine and seven right away. But I, I guess I'm not just like cashing in. That's like, oh yeah, this will work out. This could be a total fiasco. I, I, I think I, I think that's probably. I don't think there's a lot of people that are just assuming they're gonna take off now. This could definitely. I will give him credit for this that he. He he handled this he, beautifully from a timing standpoint. You know, he's a celebrated college coach. He makes a ton of money uh, doing TV. And then he got this perfect opportunity, that franchise that backed up the Brinks truck for this generational quarterback at number one overall. So he gets that and he gets full power, it seems like, uh, to set things up the way he wants. He could even do things like sign Tim Tebow because he likes him and wants to do his, his bro a solid. Like, he's set up well now. You have to produce, though. This is the National Football League. I mean, if they had two three-win seasons, I could also see him, you know, hitting the road. He's not yeah. someone that's like, hey, let me st- stick around for seven or eight years in places. So 
It's like when Reggie Bush um, quit our digital uh, television <laughs> program and headed back to Fox. Hastily, like a similar yeah. situation. To work with Urban Meyer. Um, yeah. Mark, you're up, buddy. All right. I um, am going to go inside the mind of Brown's general manager, Andrew Barry. <laughs> Music, please. I carry secrets. Things nobody else could know. A trade on the table. Odell to New England for a second rounder in the exclusive rights to special assistant Ernie Adams. <laughs> Ernie, he is not any more retired than Tom Brady. We're giving him his old office back, the bunker he slept in from 91 to 95 right here in Cleveland. Mind exercise. 777 times 555 is... 431,235. <laughs> There's just things that nobody knows. Kevin Stefanski, born May 8th, 1982. <laughs> How we were introduced to each other in the year 2000, right after I quietly solved the Y2K bug for the Clinton White House at age 13. Stefanski and I were put into that special ops program for gifted minds. A lot of crazy <laughs> shit, astral projection, remote viewing, they kept us hidden away in those caverns under Arlington Cemetery. We watched football obsessively in our downtime. Cut-ups, old film. That's how we met Ernie Adams. He was doing some really dark stuff for the Navy. People think the Browns just settled on Stefanski. I mean, come on. This was all pre-planned. Paul D. Podesta, a baseball man, just crosses over to the NFL. Everyone buys it, makes fun of him. People want simple answers. Lone gunman us alone in the universe, this goes so much deeper than people know. They have no idea what the Cleveland Browns really are, mm. why they went away, why they came back, and why they're rising again at this very hour. Barry out. Mm. Barry out to himself. I always thought the Native American flute was something that was just inside your mind, Mark. <laughs> so imagine when you're up at 3.30 in the morning, but I guess Andrew Barry as well. Yeah, Kindred. It's it's surprising because you think of Barry as this like analytics guy, you know, very you know, Harvard educated, right? I believe. Um, yeah. But no, like he, it's not just all about the numbers. It's about you know conspiracy <laughs> theories for him. Yeah, he kind of made him a shaman, or I, I, I'm not sure. How, um, let Do you me think Belichick you know, put Ernie Adams on the on the trade block like before he retired? Uh, maybe. Well, no, it, you know. That's complex, Greg. I, I, I don't know any more than what I, what I just told you. So, Does the Bloom... So I feel like Barry is right now the guy. Like, everybody loves him. Everybody loves his drafts. Everybody loves what... Including me. I'm a big, big Barry fan. Do you think the Bloom comes off the rose if they extend Baker and he struggles in the first year of his extension? Yes. Because I think that's, that is a lightning flashpoint that would get essentially everyone in the media to go crazy on the Browns. So I that just, would be it. But I mean, you know, if he plays great and then they extend him, I don't well, What do you not extend him if he has a great that's season? That's why he's smart. That's why Barry keeps on pushing the right buttons. He's right. not extending him. He's not going to make the Jared Goff mistake right now. He's going to mm. wait another year. Well, I don't know. Mm. He he's, yeah. you're just they actually a tough sound spot. the time where Goff and, um, you know, Goff got his extension and who else am I forgetting? Wentz gets his Wentz. extension is the summer right before yeah. camp. That is the time that you do this. And it does sound like they're pretty interested hmm. in doing it. it. And I don't see the big upside. What no, is Baker going to do if you make him wait? Be a year late. Be a year late. Pay $5 or million be, dollars more a year. Whatever. Do it in week I, seven. Like if he gets off to a yeah. fast start, he's going to take that money in week seven. But let's see like a little bit of year two with, no, I'm with, with you. Yeah. for some. Why not? One game, no play action. He's... <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. He's I like pushed Baker. every right button so far. I, I don't think he's a groupthink guy. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Up next, I'm going to take you inside the mind, speaking of which, of Jared Goff. Oh. Mm. Fresh start for the J-Man. <laughs> this is exactly what I needed. <laughs> Forget about my one house in Malibu and the other one near my parents' place in Napa Valley. I'm in Detroit now, baby. Lakes all around this bitch. <laughs> I don't think this one's accurate. <laughs> but should I buy? <laughs> or rent? Do the lions really like me? 
<laughs> or did they bring me here just to get those number ones? Wait a second. Wait a damn second. Did the Lions trade for me so they could replace me with a draft pick they got in the trade for me? <laughs> That's messed up. Dan Campbell wouldn't do that to me. That dude seems... Brad Holmes. That guy's a straight shooter. Upper management written all over him. He wouldn't lie to me. Right? I gotta call my agent. <laughs> oh, I feel bad for him after that. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, there's a lot of in all of us. Uh, I'll only speak for myself, but I feel like it's quite common. There's a, a, a level of self-doubt in all of us. And how could Jared Goff off this offseason think he's being set up for a long-term stay in Detroit. Now, I'll say this, I'll, I'll let, and I'll set it up, the football conversation like this. This offensive line could be awesome, potentially, or very good, okay? You go and you take um, Sewell with the first pick. That was great. You got uh, Frank Ragno. They just signed him to the extension. Um, Taylor Decker um, had a really big season uh, on the other side, and you got some solid guard play last year. Like maybe it's a really good line and that can help a quarterback immeasurably. As we know, the, the, the uh, skill players on the outside, a problem, obviously, unless somebody has a career year. Uh, but is, is there any chance a long winded question, double question, a Sessler double question, a any chance Jared Goff has a solid season and B that he's their quarterback in two years. Hmm. I think there's a chance, yeah. They I just remembered be. Anthony Lynn is the coordinator, huh? Yeah, Anthony, like he's not going to throw the ball much. He might, he might throw, throw like 484 times. I, I guess if they fall behind in games, that'll be tricky. But if he's well protected, like there's the bar is so low for him now that if he has like an 18 or 19 touchdown and 10 interception with like seven yards per attempt, like everyone's like, oh, wow, Jared Goff was better than we thought. And he's, he's capable of that. I mean, it was just last August that Mean and I jumped on the, I don't know if you want to call it a bandwagon, but the Lions something or other. Um, And they they disappointed my expectations. And I I don't think that even organizationally they're saying they're going to be um, blowing people away this year. So I don't like the setup for Jared Goff Mm -hmm. a ton. I don't think they're thinking Jared Goff's are, to to your second question, I think they begin heat-seeking a a younger quarterback probably in the next draft. Do you think they should have taken that young quarterback this year? Yes, yeah. I would have taken. I would have taken Justin Fields, Fields yeah. but it's a Lions Den, by the way. It's a Lions Den. The Lions it was den. like they. It was weird how they they basically decided ahead of time and so did the Eagles. Apparently, like they were not going to take don't. Justin Fields no matter what, which is which is surprising. Like they were trying to trade up for Sewell to four, and the Falcons wouldn't do it. Supposedly, I mean, they tried to trade up and it made it sound like pretty clear that it was going to be for Sewell. They got him at seven. That worked the, out. The, the non-rebuilding Falcons was not interested in trading down for a haul. Make it make sense. I'll, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> right. I'll stop subtweeting my subtweet. You know, whatever. Um, yeah, I Jared, Jared knows the score. I mean, when you are publicly called trade draft pick fodder, I think. Um, he pay, he seems like a guy who would pay attention to. I don't know if he's kept that golf course thing that he put in the back of his mm. house where he could where he could chip like three hundred yards below to a, to his neighbor's green. He kept missing some, something in was the going hard on. Scene. He wasn't hitting the hole, and I felt like a horrible metaphor. I do know they've <laughs> taken down the Banana Republic um, posters of golf on the Third Avenue Promenade in Santa Monica. Wow. Um, but that's because I think all the businesses have closed. So maybe yeah. it isn't just totally. A- so when things go south in the lion's den, Mina, do when I try to put together the imagery, are you devoured by the expectations? The, do the lions devour you? Do you starve inside the lions? When things go poorly in the lions, yeah, den, no, what get, is I, like, I, yeah. The, yeah. Well, the, isn't there talk of an actual lion on the sidelines now? So maybe you, yeah. you yeah. have a date with the live mascot. I like. I actually like the coaching hire. I mean, I don't know. It's it was a mistake. <laughs> it was a mistake. <laughs> mistake I mean, wouldn't the lions the, the lions themselves would become punchless and and less mm. vicious? Because that's what happens to that's what happened to the mm. actual lions in the football season. So I think you're if you're a human. You probably just get right out of there with no problem. I do like that Goff um, 
you know, had sort of the Hollywood production value that his song changed midway through. I mean, Mina's worried about she didn't write her things out. I mean, we got song cha- changes. I didn't, I didn't even know, know we could, could re- request songs. I didn't yeah. know that was a thing. God. I didn't I that too. I didn't either. One little Did you do though, acting but... like in high school or something? I, I did. Mean... This, this is just a thousand podcasts of faking it, you know? <laughs> According to Dennis Dodd hockey? of CBS Sports, Matt Campbell of Iowa State was offered an eight-year deal worth $68.5 million to leave the college ranks and take over the Lions program from Matt Patricia. Um, That's weird. Kind of weird for Dan Campbell. First of all, a guy's got the same last name, and then he's getting a seven million dollar, seventy million dollar offer. Mm. Right, and like three, I think three less years. Was like Matt Campbell had the leverage to like, get that right. kind of offer, and he didn't take it. Mm. Kind of a weird time in Detroit Lions history. All right, Mina, you're up. Oh, uh, okay. Um, this one's going to be a little subversive, I think. Mm, uh, I like it. Okay. Well, I just think, uh, you know, people call me a homer. I think this is going to fly in the face of that a little bit. No one calls me a homer, really, but, you know, well, you know, Niners fans on Twitter. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm waving my hand from you. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's me, Brian Schottenheimer. The punchline. <laughs> So many jokes in Seattle. So many memes. So many insults over the years. You wanted me to throw the ball. I did. I threw it on early downs at the highest rate in the NFL. What more did you want from me? Yeah, our offense sucked in the second half of the season. But we were still throwing the ball. Well, let let me correct that. Somebody wasn't throwing the ball to open receivers underneath. He was big game hunting. I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to name names. Russell Wilson. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't draft that offensive line I didn't pick that center Those guards One of the guards is okay Damian Lewis I think he'll be good next year It's not my fault And yet here I am The subject of scorn And blame A joke Yeah my vibes are Makes more sense in Florida And f- you know what Screw you Seattle I got six inches of height now To work with Shoddy is going to show them that it wasn't my fault. Wow, that's a little that's internal it. pep talk, and I love. Wow, it. yeah. Whoa. Sort of, you know. Uh, I'm picturing him like looking in the mirror, like shirtless, just pumping his fist. Like as I, he's thinking this. But that big cross. This, this connects thing. to my <laughs> yes. um, to my my conspiracy theory that Russell Wilson partly put out all the trade requests to distract everyone from his his self started MVP campaign crashing off the tracks because of the worst 10 game stretch of his entire career which for whatever reason he got like no blame for maybe from some Seahawks fans like yourself I mean I think kind of noticed but I feel like nationally it was just like their offensive line stinks and Brian shot and it, oh, and, oh and they stopped like trying to throw the ball it's like no Russell like it happens I'm not that worried long term but that yeah. was the worst 10 game stretch of his career he struggled if anything Schottenheimer showed flexibility because you just thought you're going to get this guy that's the same offense year after year. And he went for it last year. I mean, he kind of did everything Russell Wilson asked for, but I think we're just so, I, I've never really even heard any critique of Russell Wilson, the quarterback on the field ever. So it was sort of probably a mental shift and adjustment that we couldn't handle in season. And it, you know, it's funny to me, like there are the baldies of the world and other people that really understand the nuances of offensive line play and what's actually going on in the trenches. And, but you don't need to be that person to see what was happening in points with Seattle's offense last year. He just held the ball too long. And that was yeah. a big game hunting that was internally uh, his offensive coordinator was thinking about in his mind shirtless with a giant cross like that. <laughs> you didn't have to be an expert to see that Russell Wilson maybe was trying to do too much. And that was killing the team. At the, time. the other thing I wanted to say, but, and I would have remembered if I had written down my script, but I didn't um, is <laughs> they played the Rams twice. They played Aaron right. Donald twice. You know, Tough. I think we are, Oh, like there, it, there's a bit of a sample size issue and competition uh, factor into this. All right, fair. All right, Greg, you're up. All right, uh, we're gonna get inside the mind of uh, Zach Taylor, Bengals coach. Mm. Oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> I'm good enough. I'm oh, smart no. enough. Oh no. <laughs> Doggone it, people like me. Stuart well, Smalley. Except for that Mark Sessler character. What mm. is his deal? Always wanting to punch down on us poor Bengals because his Browns have a little success. Well, whatever happened to Ohio Unity? That's a thing. 
Why don't we both rise up and take over these bullies in Pittsburgh and Baltimore? I mean, well, what's not to like about this team? Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, Joe Mixon, Joey Burrow. Okay. I dare say that group is better than the one in Cleveland. Better oh. than the Steelers. Better than the Ravens in terms of offense. And here I see how Mark say how forgettable I am. Well, over and over. Sorry if I like polos instead of <laughs> button downs, Mark. Oh. Why don't you try winning back-to-back games in the NFL with Ryan Finley and Brandon Allen? That, that happened. It's going to happen a lot more in 2021. Just you watch out, Mr. Sessler. Oh, now I feel bad. He does seem like a good dad on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, Mark. you know, he he's made a good Mr. He's made a good case for how strong the roster is. So where are the wins? Um, I, I, my thing with Zach Taylor is this. I just don't understand. I don't understand who he is at this point. We're two seasons in. He was hired to be kind of like a Sean McVay offshoot. Um, you have your quarterback now. Like, I think there's the, the, there are bright skies ahead. But, in, you know, if in year three, you better produce. Although the only thing that go, going in his favor is the Bengals move um, about with the speed of molasses when it comes to any sort of coaching change. So he's probably safe until at least 20... 31. <laughs> so do we get, where do you come down on Mina? The um, passing on Sewell for Jamar oh Chase. Boy. Is, are they going to, are they going to rue that decision or is Jamar Chase uh, a transcendent talent and how upset can you really get if that guy's a superstar? I thought it was a defensible pick. I would have taken Sewell, but I didn't think it was like a wildly bad decision. I actually thought the Dolphins should have gotten more criticism for, um, not taking Sewell, but that's fair. I dared to say on NFL Live, this is a really great place for me to air out all my Twitter grievances and straw men, whatever. <laughs> I dared to good. say that the way what I said, I'm probably making it sound more reasonable in my retelling of my own hot take. But I said the most pressure in this organization is on Jonah Williams in this offensive line because the Bengals basically bet on that group being good enough right. to keep Joey healthy. And, you know, the first week they get Daniel Hunter, Cleo Mack, and TJ Water, the first three elite pass rushers. Mm. And Bengals fans went crazy at me for because apparently not treating Riley Reef like prime Lane Johnson is a sin. And <laughs> um, I don't I sorry. I think that we will see very quickly if it was a mistake. I worry about Jonah Williams health. I actually liked him as a college prospect. But that is a big bet on that dude, and he has not stayed on the field. So, I yeah. I think it makes sense. I mean, I think like a great wide receiver is maybe a little less than a, a great left tackle. But you're betting that Jamar Chase is in, in a, a, another level above where Sewell will be, like in terms of tackle ranking. And I don't doubt that that Mike Brown, who's ultimately making these or influencing these decisions. And, and loves like big college names and everything like that is thinking let's keep Joe Burrow happy. His contract negotiation is in a couple of years. The last real quarterback that we had like sat out cause he didn't want to play our, with our franchise like that. It's getting to at least for a team like the Bengals that there might be some NBA thinking with like you do with Gian- Giannis where it's like, we got to get people around him that he likes and, and keep him. And I Just think that do- makes sense. The bar's low here. You can win six or seven games if Joe Burrow I think he would have liked the idea of Sewell, it. you know, come actual games too, but mm. I hear you. You should do, Greg, the um, Mike Francesa move if you can't pronounce the Buck, uh, the Giannis. Milwaukee Bucks start. Just call him uh, the Greek Freak. What do you think about the Greek Freak? <laughs> I just don't understand how people are still saying Gian. No, I know. Right. You, sorry, Greg, but I. It's we say it all the time now. The last name is. I hard think it was because I probably like never said his name out loud. Well, but you're you're also a football yeah. person. I'm on shows with people who talk about basketball yeah. for a living yeah. and still do it. It blows my mind. Quick Zach Taylor theory: He would be much more memorable if he had a different haircut. Yes, he looks like uh, like me. He looks like every normal, base, right, that, basic, weird, you know, white dude. So that's our. That's basically been our, name your too. issue Makes or sense. our issue throughout. Is that he looks? He's got like a polo on. He just like looks like he's about to hit 
like 18 holes at like the local municipal, like not <laughs> even a private, like private. He's not going to Riviera with not even Michaels 18. He, he couldn't get the whole He's afternoon. Doing nine. He's doing the wife couldn't get him the whole afternoon. He got he, nine. I mean, look at Lafleur in the same coaching tree with the eyebrows and the skin. Yeah. He glows the slick side mm. part. And then you got Zach Taylor who looks like a realtor next to him. I mean, don't get us started on the, uh, on the DC either. Captain Lou Albano. He's got to put rubber bands and grow out a beer to, <laughs> Beard to put his mark in the league. All right, close this out, Mark Sessler. All right, we are going to be um, looking into the rather mysterious mind of Jack Easterby. Oh, boy. Hit it, Ricky. Be careful here now, Mark. I know. It's, I, I, this is his thoughts. <laughs> yeah, Jackie, baby. We're feeling real good about this Texans team. A real unique squad, guided by something. We're feeling real good. Tyrod. Hmm. You know what? Might drive to 7-Eleven today. Pick up a treat. Something special. Something zesty. A treat for Jackie, baby. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Almond Joy's got nuts. Mounds don't. From another angle. Fresh Baby Ruth. Fresh Butterfinger. Baby Ruth and Butterfinger. Fresh guaranteed. Like the Texans, baby. It's Friday. Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend. Weekend. Yesterday was Thursday. Today is Friday. We, we, we so excited. We so excited. <laughs> Texans, baby. You can feel it in the air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. I love the Mark because you're a little bit older than us. Your commercials aren't our commercial era, but that felt I loved it. But yeah. Rebecca Black being Jack Easterby's favorite artist is something I'll never be able to get out of my mind now. Can you walk? I us mean, Ricky interviewed Rebecca bit? Black. So, like, how did <laughs> you end up on that set of ref? I just want to just. Dive into your brain for a no, second. You be careful, Mina. I'm, yeah. I just want to know. <laughs> I mean, this is uh, you know we there. It's a touchy character to to go into on this show, um, uh, considering who we work for. So I tried to keep it just sort of those I don't that know. go in that go yeah. into the mind of the quiet storm, Mina. Sometimes don't come out. <laughs> That's the only right. Thing That's. Say. I mean, this wasn't too different than you know. We we've been into the mind of Mark uh, quite a bit. Mina's not as um, experienced, <laughs> but I think. Like it felt in character with that, but I felt like this was as gentle and um, forgiving an evaluation of of Mister yes. Easterby and um, what's really going on inside. And it in now that I know this is what's going on inside, like it makes a lot of sense what's happening in Houston. It's like a right. nicer way of viewing uh, the, all the events that are going if, on. If the man, if the secret Svengali <laughs> behind the scenes for the Houston Texans was a raving <laughs> lunatic. Um, that would explain a lot. <laughs> I mean, he just, no, he just yeah. likes snacks. He's, he's just a quirky. simple man who's looking <laughs> the, forward to the weekend. Those he's a happy guy. Of audio, that's the best media Jack Easterby's gotten in his entire life. <laughs> right. Days. I hope exactly. the Texans feel that way. I mean, I'm, if anything, I'm trying exactly. to, yeah. you know, curry some favor. Sure. All right. I let's let's started. exit these minds. It's 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 time to was step away. All right, Mina, you said it all. <laughs> you came on. And you've said it all, and we thank you so much. Did I? Did I? I think you did. I think you had a really, again, rock solid appearance. I struck on the back show at my 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 haters, perceived and real. <laughs> well, use it any way you need to. I think that was a good good way to operate. Yeah. All right. And, good. And you know where to find me you know, all over ESPN and check out our <laughs> podcast, which is great. And um, we'll be back. Well, we got the network show. See, we are we're on TV too, Mina. I, the around yeah, the NFL yeah. broadcast Friday <laughs> uh, at a new earlier time, right after Good Morning Football. How about oh, that? Yeah. I think that's a that's solid even. time slot. So we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> so check that out Friday, and then we'll be back with another week of shows. I have to go pick up my son at preschool, so I gotta go. That I have to say it. I have to. I have to go. So we're gonna sign off now. Thank you, Mina. Stan Hansen signing off for Quiet Storm, the old boss, rookie Hollywood. But, behind the virtual glass and the great Mina Kimes. 
Until Friday, keep the call! Thank you.